Ladies and gentlemen, the camera has not made a mistake, nor do your eyes deceive you in the impression you get from this picture that these cars are going backward. Present-day motor cars are indeed going backward, insofar as the efficiency of their body design is concerned. Let's take a look at motor car traffic as of the year 1925, just a little less than a decade ago. Then the average speed on the highways was 35 miles an hour, and the average automobile engine boasted a 50-horsepower motor. About the fastest that motor would drive the car of that day was 65 miles an hour. Contrast that with the conventional car of today, with a 100 horsepower engine, capable of driving the car at the top speed of 80 miles an hour, resulting in raising the average speed on the highways today to about 50 miles an hour. Today's car has twice the horsepower, yet will go only 25% faster. Think of it, doubling the power giving only one quarter more speed. As the puzzle picture artist would say, what's wrong here? Has automobile speed reached the so-called saturation point? Has the law of diminishing returns run its course in the relation between power and speed? Well, insofar as conventional cars are concerned, the answer would seem to be yes, for the present day engine is already big enough. Now it occupies about one third of the space of the car and its weight is about one quarter of the total weight of the vehicle. Obviously, people buy and use automobiles to ride in, to carry things in, and not just for the fun of hauling around a power plant. It is apparent that if any more speed is to be squeezed out of the present day car, the engine has to be relatively still much larger. In other words, the automobiles of conventional type must be more and more engine and less and less body. Anyone who has ever put his hand out of a car window and felt the pressure which the air exerted on it might have guessed at the answer to this dilemma, that it lay in overcoming air resistance quite as much, or maybe even more, than in conquering ground friction. To get some idea of what wind can do, take a look at this, the effects of a hurricane. Yet the wind which wrought all this havoc did not move any faster than that which goes by your car when you are driving at top speed. Carl Breer, one of the country's leading automotive engineers, had observed all these wind phenomena and speculated upon their relation to automobile design. Because he was in the employ of an automobile manufacturer who was not hogtied to either engineering tradition or artistic fetishes, he was in a position to do something more than guess at what might be done toward designing an automobile which would really take wind resistance into account. Aeronautical engineers were consulted. Among them, Orville Wright, one of the famed inventors of the airplane. The Wright brothers had done a great deal of pioneer experimenting in Dayton in what was called a wind tunnel. Small blocks of wood were mounted on a tiny chassis running on a track and were attached to a weight which rested on a post office scale so as to measure the push of the wind blown into the tunnel as it was varied, corresponding to differing speeds of travel. These little toys reveal the amazing fact that blunt blocks with rounded edges offered less resistance to the wind than blocks which were not to resemble the shape of the conventional automobile. Blocks of many different shapes were experimented with to compare the wind pressure of forms of varying contours in both horizontal and vertical planes. The engineers wanted to know just why the wind slipped around some shapes with less resistance than others. And following the well-known axiom that seeing is believing, they devised ingenious methods for seeing the air in all phases of its behavior. They used streamers to mark the course of the air currents. They blew smoke into the tunnel and watched its performance as the air swept it along. But more accurately still, they made the air chart its own movements on the metal plates painted with a mixture of oil and lamp black and bisecting the blocks at varying angles. Accordingly, Fred Zeter, vice president of the Chrysler Corporation in charge of engineering, had a large wind tunnel built in Detroit in the Chrysler Engineering Laboratories. And the size of the experimental models was stepped up to one-tenth actual car size. Fifty of them were built for the engineers to play with. And here are some of the startling facts.
facts they discovered. First, that air resistance on the front end of an automobile is extremely important, increasing as the square of the speed. In other words, that the resistance at 50 miles an hour is four times, not two times, as great as it is at 25 miles an hour. Second, that the power required to drive the car increases as the cube of the speed. For instance, in actual tests made on a 1933 model car, it was found that to overcome air resistance alone at 40 miles an hour, seven of the car's available horsepower were required. But to overcome air resistance alone at 80 miles an hour required 56 of the available horsepower. Think of it, eight times the power to double the speed. But they made a third discovery equally revolutionary. That was that the drag or pull on the back end of a car is as great as the front end resistance, but for different reasons. Bicycle riders have observed this phenomenon as they followed behind automobiles and trucks. For instance, the world's record for unpaced cycling, which stood for 19 years, was made by a Frenchman by the name of Richard, who drove his bicycle 27 and 8 tenths miles in a single hour. Then along came a wise guy, who pedaled along in the wake of an automobile and drove his bicycle 76 miles in a single hour. The car literally sucked him along. It seemed to Zeter, Skelton, Breer, and their associate engineers in the Chrysler Laboratories that the answer to more speed without more power or to the same speed with greater engine efficiency lay not in the size and design of the engine as much as in the shape and design of the car itself, in somehow reforming the front end and the rear deck so as to cut down both head-on resistance and rear-end back pull. Fish in the water, duck, geese, and birds in the air, all these objects are streamlined forms fashioned by nature for effortless movement through the fluid mediums in which they function. If the eye could see the flow of the water or air as these streamlined forms move through these fluid mediums, it would observe this behavior, a gentle parting of the fluid at the front end and a smooth, even flow past the body, joining again at the rear end quietly, unperturbed. On the other hand, if forms that are not streamlined are moved through a fluid medium, currents, eddies, whirlpools, or vortices are produced at the sides or rear, or both. In the light of these natural phenomena, then, it is apparent that a perfectly streamlined car would be one whose exterior surface is so shaped that when passing through the fluid medium of the air, it would create a minimum of disturbance in the forms of eddies or partial vacuums tending to produce back pull. An aeronautical engineer recently made the statement that an otherwise perfect airship, which had to carry mud guards, wheels, axles, bumpers, and spare tires, all scaled up in size and fastened on the outside of its hull, would have a top speed of about six miles an hour. It would, obviously, never be practical have proved that for a car with the engine in the front, the most desirable position for it because of its great weight, as tests and experience had proved, not at the very front end of the car, but it's directly over the front axle. At the same time, the body engineers saw a chance to realize their fondest dream, to lift the car body off the old type platform frame and to make the structural members of the body itself become the frame of the car. Now, with a broadside arrangement like this, it was apparent that in this new type car, the rear seat, as well as the front seat, could be cradled between the front and rear axles. For in this body and frame design, it was possible to move the rear seat forward by as much as 20 inches. Let's look again at this diagram of the car, which shows the heavy weight of the engine centered directly over the front axle and balancing it directly over the rear axle weight of the luggage, the gasoline tank, and the spare tire. This distribution of weights in the airflow Chrysler is like that in a dumbbell. In the conventional car, the engine rests back of the front axle, concentrating the mass of the car toward the center of the vehicle. It makes the car more like a ball insofar as its weight distribution is concerned. Have you ever noticed how easy it is to oscillate a ball? 
but how difficult it is to oscillate a dumbbell. The ball sways easily with a quick, short motion. The dumbbell moves much less and much more slowly with the same amount of effort. Well, for a similar reason, the airflow Chrysler is disturbed much less when going over a bump. Here, for example, is what happens when the front wheel hits a bump in a conventional car. The rear end goes down like a teeter-totter. As the front wheels pass over the bump, the rear springs begin to push the rear end up. And when the rear wheels go over the bump, they shoot the rear end up with a cumulative force of a double bump, and the passengers often hit the road. In the airflow Chrysler, all this useless, tiring motion is avoided because with the scientific weight distribution, when the front wheel hits a bump, the rear end is not affected at all because the pivot point of the teeter board is over the rear axle. Likewise, when the rear wheel hits a bump, the pivot is over the front axle, and there is no front end movement either up or down. We have already shown how the back seat, as well as the front, is cradled between the front and rear axles an arrangement impossible in the conventional car design without extending the wheelbase to unmanageable lengths. The rear seat just naturally has to be near one end of the teeter-totter, with its passengers bobbing up and down and around the pivotal point back of the front seat. The airflow Chrysler ought to be, and is, a very safe car to drive. Can you imagine a car so sturdily constructed that its body structure is 40 times more rigid than that of the conventional car? Old-style automobiles employ frames to rest the body on and to give them rigidity and strength. In the new Chrysler, the structural members of the body are the frame. The car is built like a skyscraper, or better yet, like an enclosed truss bridge. The passengers ride in the frame, not on it. Part of it, the strong steel girders, are actually overhead. The airflow Chrysler with a floating ride and genuine streamlined design. The more you see of it, the better you will like it, which is always true of any article based on sound, functional design. But you have only seen and heard the story of this newest creation of nature and man working hand in hand and side by side. You must also feel its difference from conventional cars to appreciate the real significance of the expression, fashion by function. Ride in it. Ride in it.